Good afternoon, everyone. On a scale of one to 10, that was a negative two. Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, for my perfectionist, give me a 10. Good afternoon, everyone. I bring you blessings, health, for grace, peace, and joy, and justice. By way of brief introduction, my name is Reggie Hubbard. So the yoga with Reggie, that's me. Yeah, black and brown people do yoga too. In fact, it's our indigenous wisdom. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and I humbly stand before you today acknowledging that we are on the unceded territory of a variety of native people of Iroquois Lenape, Shawnee, Wyandotte, Mohican, and Tisagarawami, blessings, and ask their blessing on our, on our event and the endeavor to spring forth from this event. I'm a native from the DC metro area, the DMV, so let me state my unequivocal support for DC statehood as a pivotal part of any voting reform. I'd also like to acknowledge my ancestors, both biological and spiritual, and through their lived experience, either through my lived experience or through the wilds of my imagination. And I ask their blessing upon the words that I offer, and may the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be of benefit to all beings, reducing harm in the world and awakening the sweet aroma of actualized justice in our broken world. Ashe and amen. I am the founder and chief serving officer of Active Peace. I'm a recovering political operative. A <laughs> this is like a 12-step program here. I'm a recovering polit political operative. And I'm a trained yoga and meditation teacher that works to bring peace to activists, operatives, and organizations through wellness as a foundation, not as an afterthought. And many of you have come to my yoga classes and meditation classes over the years. Shout out to those who came to the Prince class this afternoon. And given the fact that the world that we hope for requires us to heal ourselves first, please reach out and connect to me if I can be of service to you, all right? And as I've walked around this week, many of you are meeting for the first time or in person. Some of you have looked at me quizzically, and look, I never left the movement, I just left my old job, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm still in this game, right? And some of you probably never heard of me and don't care to, and I'll just say to you humbly, of course, you may never heard me, but I promise you'll never forget me, all right? But I'm not here to talk about me. I fervently believe in the power of we. We the people, we the movement, we the mighty heirs of a legacy and midwives to a beautiful future that beckons us if we joyously hold hope for it. The theme of this afternoon is how we win and save democracy. And my task is a, and blessing is to set the table for our other speakers to bring us home, to offer you a word of joy and inspiration as we face the work ahead of us. We must remember that our work is spiritual and therefore sacred. Our mental and physical health are sacred. And I'll say this to my overachievers, you cannot have a fresh idea from an exhausted mind. I'll say that again for my homies in the back. You cannot have a fresh idea from an exhausted mind. Am I right? And I believe that we hold the legacy from time immemorial to defy the status quo, both internal and external. And like Brother Mondale mentioned at the beginning of our time together, we gotta stop projecting faulty notions of what we think ain't possible, okay? Who says we can't keep majorities in the House and the Senate? Who says that, right? Because these are probably the same people that said we would never impeach Donald Trump, and we did it twice, okay? They said nothing would ever happen in the 117th Congress, and if y'all been paying attention, we've been doing some things. We have the winning message, and we have the numbers on our side, so to me, as an organizer, it's a matter of mindset and deep organizing. We approach the task that we have with joy, confidence, and hope. And if you listen close enough, you can hear the cheers of our ancestors and the future generations calling us forth in this moment. Our ancestors know tough times, so their cheers are rooted in resilience, wisdom, and lived experience. Future generations are cheering us on because they know we're up for the task at hand. But in order for us to rebuild and reimagine the world, we must change some things about how we, you know, how we do our work because as Audre Lord reminds us, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. The master's tools are driven by fear, hatred, and control. So our tools must be driven by courage, love, and freedom. Sonia Renee Taylor talks about 
how the pandemic has given us new awareness, and that new awareness requires new tools. And the tools I want to talk to you about today are well-being and defiant joy. We tend to sweep aside discussions about well-being and hope as like wishy-washy or too woo. Um, the only woo I follow is Wu Tang, but like, you know, or you say, yeah, that's cool, but we have more work to do. True. And how boring is that? That's just, sorry, how boring is that? You know, sorrow and joy can live together. And by virtue of the task that we've had to make sense of what's happened over the past several years, we all have a sense of fatigue, right? We're tired, and that's cool. And maybe we're used to bad news, and maybe we're comfortable with bad news, and we don't want to be disappointed, or we just don't want to have the energy to hold our hope. So I have three comments to that. One, I believe to the core of my being in the power of transformation, courage, hope, and love. I believe that grind culture is self and its self-destructive tendencies are, by, are rooted in white supremacy and capitalist norms that demonize rest and call joy haughty and, and unnecessary. We can do better than that. And probably most importantly, I don't want to be a part of a movement that doesn't dance and celebrate. I don't, I, you can miss me with that shit. So to model this behavior, I brought one of my gongs. And I'm going to name a few things that we should celebrate with joy. Um, so let's begin by the fact that we're here, celebrating in person. We flipped the house in 2018, impeached the motherfucker in 2019, and removed him in 2020. We won 2020 by such margins that they couldn't believe it and had to make up a big lie. We won majorities in the Senate and the House and passed powerful legislation with a slim majority. We have a sister named Katanji, the Honorable KBJ, with locks, a public defending pedigree, and impeccable history of service as the first black woman on the Supreme Court. We heard this week about the inspiring work that's happening here in Western Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. And as Summer Lee reminds us, we don't fight the power, we take the power. And so what I'm gonna do, uh, one more thing, how about ALU? So I'm gonna count to three. And when I get to three, exclaim something that you're happy about in this moment. So, and it's going to be a noise, noisy mess, but so what? So is the movement. One, two, three. Y'all, how, how, how did that feel to celebrate something? We owe it to ourselves and future generations to hold space for joy in hard times because to quote Southern black church parlance, trouble don't last always. And if our heads are always downcast, we may miss a beautiful rainbow that exists in the storm. And I'll close this time together by offering a recipe that I offered. So last week I got to give a keynote speech in honor of my 96 year old grandma as she received a lifetime achievement award from her local NAACP. So think of this in the cadence of a grandmother's recipe for resilience. First, you take a heaping cup of adversity and let it settle. Add prayer and faith as a leavening agent to the cup of adversity. Allow tears to add liquid and salt to the adversity, prayer and faith. Then have a heavy pour of humility <laughs> to soften the ego and allow discernment to rise. Blend in a generous portion of compassion to allow yourself to feel what you feel, sadness, anger, disappointment, sorrow, because if you don't allow for these emotions to, to take root or take rise, their, their suppression might make the batter a little too bitter. Add in a pinch of grit and a heaping spoonful of tenacity to season the mixture and make it a little spicy. I mean, this is net roots, we gotta make it spicy, right? Add a generous amount of sweetness and tenderness to counter hard-heartedness that might arise. Because as my grandmother often counseled, make sure the words that come out of your mouth are sweet because you may have to eat them one day. <laughs> Fold in some humor 
and lightheartedness so the mixture doesn't become too heavy and unable to manage. And prior to cooking, add a dash of perseverance, the continued effort to do or achieve something despite difficulties, failure, and opposition to cut any defeatism that may arise from the acidity of adversity. Allow the mixture to bake at an even temperature in the oven of perspective so as not to burn out. And when the dish reaches a desired consistency, let it cool so wisdom can settle in. Sprinkle generously with hope, the steadfast belief in a brighter tomorrow, and serve with joy and peace. I wish you all rich blessing for peace, self, self safety, health, and continued success. May the celebration of joy that we just had tear down the poison of pessimism and unleash the power of passion, purpose that resides in our hearts. When we win, when we have belief and hope and take care of ourselves and one another. Ashe. Next up, Anad Shenka Osorio of ACO Communications. I don't get a gong? The shoes. It is such an incredible honor to be here with you today and to talk about how we're going to win. A message is like a baton that needs to be passed from person to person to person. If it gets dropped anywhere along the way, it doesn't get heard. A message that no one hears is, by definition, not going to persuade them. And so it is with this in mind that I present to you hot off the presses brand new research under the branding Protect Our Freedoms, the work of an incredible coalition of groups, many of you right here, guided and led by myself and my incredible colleague and Netroots fan, Jennifer Fernandez and Kona, many of you know her, way to win, yes and our colleagues at Future Forward carried out by these incredible movement groups. This project in which we've been engaged for the last few months has the goal of the made-up word of Moby Suasion. Because we need to put to bed the tired ass debate, are we doing turnout, are we doing persuasion, which is really just racially coded speech for are we finally going to give a shit about voters of color, or will we keep putting our eggs in the flipping white people basket? It turns out that that is a false dichotomy, because turnout is persuasion. If your words don't spread, they don't work. If the middle doesn't hear the message, then it will never move them. And so what we look and test for across the hundred or so ads that we've made is this sweet spot of Moby suasion with attention to the responses of voters of color, measuring both for the horse race, for mobilization indicators, and for democratic favorability. And what we learn across this project is a story that applies to the ads I will share, but also to the overarching narrative that we've constructed. We have to tell a story not just about Republicans and Democrats and voters, but we have to tell the story of the election itself as a crossroads, a decision point in which we can either allow Trump Republicans to take us backwards into the Mesozoic era, roughly speaking, by overturning the will of the people and controlling us and ruling only for the wealthy white few, or the protagonists who notice are the voters, not the Democrats, remember that vote is a verb, it's an action we need people to take, not merely an idea or belief we need them to hold. And so we must actually talk to them about voting. The voters who can move us forward to protect our families, our freedoms, and our futures. The first principle is that we have to draw a contrast. We must both say what we're for and draw out in clear terms exactly what we confront. The desires and wishes of Trump Republicans as held up against what voters want. Drawing a giant us and making clear the peril and threat represented by them. 
For example, which side are you on? Americans who believe liberty and justice are for all? Or traitors inciting violence against our country and trying to take away our freedoms? Which side are you on? People who work for a living and care for our families? Or the Trump Republicans who block everything our families need? This November, it's time to show which side you're on. Vote for Democrats. FF PAC is responsible for the content of this ad. It's actually vital that we use a modifier when we reference Republicans. What we find in our testing is that this doesn't matter just to swing voters, but also to our surge. That all important grouping that turned out newly in 18 or 20 that we need to return. When we impugn all Republicans as a category, people hear us just playing standard partisan politics and they find it repugnant, even if they are Democrats. When we use a modifier, what that allows is for voters to come to our cause and to truly understand that this is a particular peril. And it's all of us that stand against it. The second principle we see throughout our testing, unsurprisingly, is that we are in a persuasion window. Ads and messages that either are about or reference Roe and Dobbs are more persuasive than the rest of the content we're looking at. So we can weave these threads together and activate loss aversion, make it clear to our voters, both surge and swing, exactly all that's on the table to lose. In America, we value our freedom. The Trump Republicans want to take it away. They're taking the Supreme Court ruling further and launching a total ban on abortion. Joe Biden and Democrats believe that we should make our own health care decisions and will always protect women's right to choose. This November, your freedom is on the ballot. If Trump Republicans win, they'll take away your rights. Protect your freedoms. Vote for Democrats. FFPAC is responsible for the... You heard a whole lot about freedom. I'm gonna say some more. If we want to be heard, we have to be able to repeat a coherent story, not an unending laundry list of ideas and policy positions. And what we find throughout testing, and actually we've been at this for a while, is that freedom is an overarching frame that allows us in few words to both capture what it is we stand for and what it is we confront from the other side. Now, lest you think that I have taken leave of my senses, which is entirely possible, and I am trying to get us all to adopt some sort of right-wing framing, I want to remind you of two things. The first is that freedom is a fundamental, essential idea that Americans hold across demographic groups. When we ask Americans, and this is true throughout polling, this is just simply one example from an almost 10,000 person survey that we fielded in 2021, but this is true in all public polling. If you ask Americans what value do you most associate with this country, they will say freedom. And that's true across place, across age, across race. We cannot let the right wing own freedom, especially when they're Every maneuver is to eliminate and destroy the freedoms of everyone who does not look, live, and love like them. Not on my fucking watch will they pretend that they can claim freedom. Freedom has also been essential to the progressive story. From the economic, impartial, not complete, not adequate gains of FDRs for freedoms during the New Deal to the civil rights movement, Freedom Summers, Freedom Riders, and to, of course, the freedom to marry in the marriage equality fight. What we find in testing is that pluralizing actually matters. I like to tell people I'm here to tell you words mean things. Freedoms, plural, hinges, tinges, progressive, whereas freedom in the singular activates a more conservative idea. How do we create a compact, overarching message that is rooted in freedom that allows us to talk about a whole lot of things at once? We open with a shared value, what we're for. Americans value our freedoms. We name the villains second and we ascribe motivation to their actions. 
but Trump Republicans want to take away freedom from all who do not look, live, and love like them. From freedom to decide if and when we grow our families, there's the Roe reference to freedom to vote, to freedom for our families to thrive, Trump Republicans want to control us, use violence to overthrow elections, and block the policies we favor. Americans must join together across race, place, and party to protect our freedoms. In 2020, we defeated Trump. This November, we will defeat Trumpism. Next, we need to remember that politics isn't solitary, and unfortunately for us, our voters don't just hear from us. They hear the unrelenting, fear-mongering, race-baiting, anti-trans rhetoric of our opposition in a choose-your-own-adventure of scapegoating, because that is all the right has. Fortunately, we have been looking for years now at a way to contend with this, because newsflash, just pretending it's not happening, isn't working, because voters are still hearing it from the other side. There is no such thing as race neutral. Our choice to not talk about race, to not talk about gender, doesn't shut off the conversation. It means the only thing voters hear is from the other side. And so we America have- America is a country that works, and works, and works. But honestly, we're stuck. Too many Republicans and the corporations who buy them are making it harder and harder to get what we are. They rigged the rules, and now they're trying to divide you by blaming immigrants, or black folks, or poor people. This November, vote for all of us. Vote Democrats. Way to win AF is responsible for the content of this advertising. The framework of that ad and the others I'll show in this section follows a pattern. It opens with a shared value that explicitly names race, in some cases gender, class, et cetera, that calls out the very axes of division that the right wing is trafficking in. It affirms what we're for and what we believe, and then introduces the villain and their tactics second. And those tactics are of deliberate division, shaming and blaming, in other words, scapegoating, and explains not just what they're doing without ever repeating their accusations, but why? That it is about getting us to point our fingers in the wrong direction so that they can pick our pockets with the other hand. It is because if they get us to focus on some invented other, we will not notice that they're the ones handing kickbacks to corporations and making all of our families suffer. Obviously, this has hit a new nadir for them with their attacks on first trans youth and now trans people generally. And so, as part of our research work, and all of these materials are on our website, everything we make is open source, same goes with the ads, they're all whitelisted. We looked at a greatest hits of right-wing hatred and fear-mongering, and we tested messaging against them. And what we found is that we can prevail. This message we call freedom from boxes and treats both race and gender. What we find in the testing is that when folks are exposed both to this greatest hits of right-wing vitriol and this freedom from boxes message, again, freedom, very intentional, we can move them both toward wanting candidates who are not going to allow discrimination against transgender people and towards supporting teaching CRT in schools. Yes, I know, and Randy's about to come up here. I know we don't teach CRT in K-12. It's a survey question. We ask the survey that way to hold ourselves to a really high bar. Because if we can clear that, that means the messaging is working. So what does this sound like in 30 second ad form like this? Daddy says that no matter our colors, or genders, we all want freedom to live our dreams. But mommy says that there are bad guys trying to get money and power by telling us who we can be, what we can do, even who we can love, deciding our futures for us. But I'm a superhero. You can be one too if you demand action and vote for freedom to wear a cape or not. I'm gonna keep mine on.
And then finally, we need to remember that in every election, there are three people running, our person, their person, and stay at home. And stay at home has the home team advantage because people are already at home. We need to recall that people are exhausted, they're despondent, they're despairing, they are dealing with a whole lot. And for a lot of our voters, they are understandably tuning out everything that has to do with politics in order to try to get through the day. And so we have also engaged in a project with colleagues at Frameshift just to look at disaffected Dems. And what I'm going to show you now in sequence is the two ads in the randomized control trial track that did best, and then I'll talk about why they did best. 60 years ago, this seemed impossible. 15 years ago, this seemed impossible. 10 years ago, this seemed impossible. We decide what's possible. Be a voter. We've got a mission coming up soon, and we need everyone, everywhere to join the team. I'm talking your neighbor, your uncle, that woman at work that never laughs at your jokes. The mission? To make life better for you and your family. How do we pull it off? By getting every courageous American to vote. Let's get the gang back together, because taking action together is how we get things done. What both of those ads do is abate cynicism but by reminding people of previous achievements. That seems simple, but what we have seen in testing is that it both works and it is very necessary. In essence, to spread the message, yes, we did, and therefore, yes, we can, and yes, we will. Remember, if you want people to come to your cause, you need to be attractive. And like a magnet that pulls people in, that means you need to stand for something and you need to have a polarity. There is an opposition here and we have an opportunity to both say what we're for, affirm what we will deliver and draw a contrast. That doesn't happen by shrinking from hard issues. It comes from standing with and for each other and making it absolutely clear what Trump Republicans intend and will do. Yes, we did. Yes, we can. And yes, we will. Thank you. I am thrilled to have the honor to introduce uh, Randy Weingarten, American Federation of Teachers president. And if anyone knows about delivering powerful, potent, repeated, effective messaging, it is my friend Randy. Okay, I took a lot of notes from what Anat just said. I hope you did too, in between the drinks. So, joy is an act of spiritual and political resistance. Did I get that right, Reggie? And what word are we gonna talk about all the time? Starts with F. No, no, it's not that other word that starts with F. Starts with F, ends with M. What is it? Wait, wait, wait. What did, what did Anat just teach us? So it's an honor for me to be here, and it's an honor for me to be with the activists who have moral courage every single day, regardless of what is going on in the world. And I know tonight's theme is how we win, and how we save democracy, not whether we win, but how. And I think that's because the stakes are so high for our freedoms, our democracy, our schools, economic fairness, dignity, climate. I would say 
everything's on the line. And I said to my own convention this year, and yes, I am still a social studies, high school social studies teacher, that if we don't win, yeah, let's hear for teachers. If we don't win, this will be the last free and fair election we have for maybe a generation, maybe forever. And look, we know what the other side's tactics are. I'm not just told you, but you live it all the time. Fear, anger, smear. And remember how the Tea Party started, February 18th, 2009, with an infamous rant on the trading floor by a wealthy CNBC anchor. And things have gotten worse since then. And you heard Anat talk about all of this. And, and maybe the one most important thing I can tell you is, believe them when they tell you what they're doing, because they're not hiding their motives anymore. So take activist Christopher, I wouldn't even call him an activist, take Christopher Rufo, that they, to achieve their goal of essentially ending public schools as we know it, he says it, to achieve their goal of a universal voucher system, they need to be ruthless and brutal and operate from a premise of universal public school distrust. They decided when they saw what was going on in February 2021, they decided that attacking public schools was their means of dividing voters. And look at what they have done since then. Extremists playing on fear, fear of the other, fear built on false narratives. As the country becomes more diverse, they prey on racial and economic anxieties, stirring up resentment, stirring up racial, ethnic, and gender tribalism. And public education is smack in the middle of this. I'll give you two examples. Look at what Florida Governor Ron DeSantis said this week. What? He claimed that elementary school workers are instructed to tell kids to switch genders. I'm serious. Indeed, all you need to know about DeSantis is that Alex Jones just changed allegiance from Trump to DeSantis. And Trump recently said about teachers, you would not trust these people to babysit your children for 20 minutes. Why should we let them educate millions of American students? We must liberate these children from captivity of these Marxist teachers. Why am I telling you this? Because you just heard what Anat said. They're using this code. They're trying to divide. They're trying to create fear. That is who they are. The tip lines in Virginia and New Hampshire so this is what the rest of my five minutes and 15 seconds is about. What do we do about this? Because we're fighting back and we're not backing down. So when they try to ban books, you know what books they're trying to ban right now? Anne Frank, the diary of Anne Frank, the diary of Anne Frank, the books about Ruby Bridges. Why are they trying to, to ban those? Because what do those do? They create community. They create empathy. They basically say to other children that this is what happens in another religion or another race when, when kids are oppressed. And let's unify and fight that oppression together. Let's understand another kid. That's why they're banning them. So when they ban books, we give out books. A million books we're giving out of diverse titles all across the country. When they try to stop teaching honest history, we tell our members we are defending every single member who teaches honest history or who works in the best interest of children. And what are we doing now? We are working on fighting for the, for the, basics that kids need right now. 
to get them as normal a school year as possible. And why are we doing that? Because all across the country, that's what parents and kids want, to have schools where parents want to send their kids, where educators want to teach, where kids thrive. And you know what's happening when we do this? We are winning school board elections. In Montana, in New York, in New Hampshire, in Wisconsin, in Minnesota, because parents and teachers are coming together just this week. 91% of parents in Ohio said that they believe in their child's teacher. 88% of parents all across America said teachers did the best they could do. So yeah, they're gonna try to fear, and we're gonna kneel in and knee deep and come up with the best damn school systems we can do to help our kids thrive. So, how do we win? We win by defending public schooling as we are doing. School board by school board, race by race. But second, how do, am I so sure that this will work? Because we talk to people all the time and we listen to folks all the time. As any teacher will tell you, we gotta meet people where they are. And frankly, it's not what's said, it's what's heard. That's why building community, talking to folks, is so important. What do you think happened in Kansas? They talked to people, they went door to door, and they won big time. And that's why knocking on doors, engaging with colleagues and friends and families and neighbors, that's what builds trust. You're not gonna agree with everything that anyone, that everybody else says. You don't agree with what your wife or your husband says or what your siblings say. If you're he, she, they, I don't agree with my wife all the time. She doesn't agree with me any of the time. <laughs> but we talk to each other. Third, we win by voting and getting people out to vote. Yes, you've heard this over and over again. Elections really matter and the vote really counts. And yes, everybody tells you to vote and voting may feel radically insufficient. But now I'll put my high school social studies teacher hat on. Without voting and getting people out to vote, we'll never get to a majority. And without that majority, we will never get to really influence the policy on an ongoing and sustained basis. All those policies, everyone in this room wants to change. The extremists understand this. Why do you think they work overtime to limit and suppress the vote? But fourth, and this is my last one, it goes beyond voting. We win by building power, economic power, social power, and community power. And when it comes to economic power, that's what Chris Smalls is trying to do. That's what the Starbucks workers are trying to do. That's what the union movement is trying to do. And people want unions. This past year, the AFT organized 70 new units. People want it. They need organization. We need to fight together for the issues that keep us up at night. And so I'm going to end by this. I'm going to end in some ways where Reggie started. Hope, you're the activists. You're the moral conscience of this country. You're the justice seekers. You're the aspiration agents, just like my members. And as Grace Paley said, the only recognizable feature of hope is action. Action, action to get out the vote to talk to people, to make it matter, to talk about freedom, the freedom we need, the freedom we strive for, the democracy we need, the public schools we need, the economic freedom we need. And if we do that, we will see all across the country what we saw in Kansas this month. Thank you.
Let's welcome to the stage Brandon Wolf of Equality Florida. Hey, let's go, Brandon. That's the only let's go, Brandon cheer I will allow today. What's up, Netroots? How you doing today? Okay, maybe another drink and we'll be more energetic than that. Uh, it is an incredible honor to share a stage with folks like Randy, and I know Congresswoman Omar is coming up in a bit. Uh, it's been an honor to enjoy my not only first trip to Pittsburgh, but also my very first Netroots Nation conference with you all. Thank you. Hope it's not my last. I've been actually pinching myself backstage to, to make sure it's real, and part of that is because I never imagined that any of this was possible for me. Six years ago, up until that point, I, I didn't have grand dreams of stages like this or moments like these. You know, growing up as a queer young kid of color, most of my life was just about trying to find a place to belong. I grew up in a small rural town just outside of Portland, Oregon that didn't look a lot like me, didn't live a lot like me, and even the adults that I appreciated most, the ones that I looked up to the most in the world told me that the world was probably just never going to be ready for someone like me. I didn't have grand dreams of stages like this one because I didn't think they were possible for people like me. I just spent decades trying to find a shred of normalcy in all of this. I found that. Piece by piece, clawing my way to that normal. But June 11th of 2016 was the last normal day of my life. It was normal by all accounts. It was a Saturday, it was laundry day, which meant I was knee deep in socks and underwear on the couch. I was watching reruns of Star Trek The Next Generation on Netflix. I am a nerd, I admit. It was a summer day in Florida, which meant I spent time by the pool. I fell asleep on a lounge chair. And then as the sun was going down, I did the most normal thing. I texted my best friends and asked if they wanted to go and get a drink. Just before midnight, my best friends, Drew and Juan, got to my apartment. We listened to the same playlist we always listened to, watched the same music videos we always watched. I was almost never allowed to have control of the cocktail shaker because I make drinks one or two times as strong as they need to be. We're trying to get the party started. But that night they relinquished and just grimaced every time they took a sip. When it came time to choose where we were going to go, we just picked a club we'd been to a hundred times before. Pulse Nightclub was a safe space for us. It's one of the safest spaces I ever knew. And I get that that term comes with its own baggage, a safe space. It's used almost like a bludgeon online, right-wing trolls insinuating that if you need a safe space in this world, you must not be tough enough to handle it as it is. But for people like us, for queer people, especially queer people of color, safe spaces are lifelines. They're refuges we carve out for ourselves in a world that threatens violence against us every single time we walk out the door. Everything about that night was normal. The line outside the club was as long as it always was. There was this angry drag queen at the front door who always snatched my $5 out of my hand. You part a beaded doorway and walk into the club. We went to the same bartender we always went to, ordered the same drinks we always ordered. We had a spot on the patio underneath the stars where we would gather, and after a drink or two, Drew, who had a master's degree in clinical psychology, would offer you a free therapy session, whether you wanted it or not. That night, he talked about love and compassion. He wondered aloud why we let the little things get in the way of how much we care about each other so much. He was frustrated by a world that only sees how different we are instead of how alike we really are. And when he was coming in for a landing on his point, he, he had these long gangly arms and he would drape one over your shoulder to really drive it home. He draped his arm over my shoulder that night and he said, you know what I wish we did more often? is tell each other that we love each other. It was just a few moments after that that the most normal night of my life after the most normal day of my life became the extraordinary tragedy that you all know it to be. 
Just after two o'clock in the morning, I was washing my hands at a bathroom sink. I, I remember, for some reason, the poster above the urinal on the wall, the painted faces of drag queens I was familiar with. I remember this plastic cup teetering on the edge of the sink, looking like it might fall off. I remember how cold the water was from the faucet. I remember the first sound of gunshots the hair standing up on the back of my neck. I remember the feeling of panic washing over me. I remember huddling against a wall, debating whether or not I should run or hide, a dozen people rushing in, the looks on their faces like they had seen the purest form of evil. I remember the smell of blood and smoke in the bathroom, the girl behind me trying so hard not to scream that she was trembling, vibrating against the floor. I remember locking arms with this dozen people whose names I don't know and faces I wouldn't recognize today, making a run for it. I remember the, the smoke machine fog filling the room, the relentless gunfire, bang, bang, bang in the background. I remember halfway through the dance floor in the separate bar asking myself why I didn't get a chance to say goodbye to my parents, because I was convinced that I was going to die in there. And then I remember relief, a door, an emergency exit flung open, a door that I didn't even know was there until that moment. And suddenly I was standing in a parking lot, the stars and blood and smoke and confusion, but relief because I had done the impossible, I had survived. But it didn't take long for that relief to be fleeting when I remembered that my best friends, my chosen brothers, Drew and Juan, were standing in the center of the main dance floor right in that man's line of fire. In the early hours of June 12, 2016, a man charged through the front doors of the safest space I knew, armed with a Sig Sauer MCX assault rifle and thousands of rounds of ammunition. He poured over 110 rounds into a space that I could navigate with my eyes closed. 19 of them struck and killed my best friends. They became two of 49 people, mostly LGBTQ people of color who were murdered in the club that night. I didn't get in the fight against gun violence or for LGBTQ rights because I had grand dreams of stages like this one. I got in the fight because I was mad as hell, so mad at a system that had forsaken us, so mad at a system that seemed determined to put people's political ambitions over the safety of the American people, so furious at a system that kept propping up the faces of cisgender, heterosexual white men on every cable news platform while they wondered aloud how our tragedy, the murders of our friends, would play in the next presidential election cycle. I was so angry at a system that failed us, that failed my best friends by putting the profits of the gun lobby over their lives. I've seen a lot over the last six years. I've watched politicians say all the right things while the cameras are rolling and then triangulate behind closed doors every bit of it about getting themselves to the next spot in their career. I've come face to face with the corrosive influence of money in politics, watching people in real time be bought off. And I'll be honest, living in Ron DeSantis's Florida, it can sometimes feel like it's all hopeless. But I have learned a few things along the way. Like the fact that it really matters who's in positions of power. And I know that sounds like common sense and I'm probably preaching to the choir, but let's face it, in this country, elected officials who care about their constituents and are ready to do the work feel like the exception and not the rule. Allies, born of convenience, they show up for the photo op. Those politicians who tell us they're allies, they show up when the going is good, but it's accomplices who are on the front lines with us, organizing in our communities. It matters when we put accomplices, not casual allies, in positions of power in this country. And it doesn't... It doesn't just matter when they're sitting in a desk in the Oval Office, it matters on every level of government. It matters when you have accomplices in school board meetings and city commission meetings. It matters when those accomplices serve in the state legislature. I have learned that so much of the fight 
that is being waged is being waged on a state to state level. Right wing extremists have invested everything they've got in holding our local and state governments hostage. They are reaping the benefits of that work. And if we are going to fight back, we have to fight back by growing power from the ground up. I've also learned to be confident. Confident in the fact that we will win because we are right. And I want to say that again. We will win because we are right. I am confident in that. Six days after the shooting, we held a funeral service for Drew. It's one of the hardest days of my life. His mom asked me to be a pallbearer that day, and I found myself as I was pushing the casket down the aisle, gripping the pall so tightly that my knuckles were turning white. It's because I didn't want to let go of my best friend until I'd found the right words to say goodbye. We got to the front of the church. I looked down at that polished wooden box and I made him a promise. I promised him that I would never stop fighting for a world that he would be proud of. That promise has never been about me. It's always been a battle cry for all of us because a world that Drew would be proud of is a world that all of us can be proud of. It's a world that we deserve. Listen, friends. Progressives win when we are unapologetic about our vision for a better future. We need to stop being so damn scared of our own shadows and stand in the light. Progressives win. Progressives win when we are unashamed of our values and when we are unafraid to say loudly and clearly that we can do better than this. Progressives win when we refuse to let the right wing divide us up and instead insist that this country can only be a leader if we refuse to leave anyone behind. And finally, progressives win when we keep our eyes locked on, not on what can't be done or what might be too hard, but on what is possible, the beauty of what is possible. I made a promise to my best friend that I would never stop fighting for a world that he would be proud of. That world is what's possible, but it's only possible if we're willing to fight for it. Thank you. Welcome to the stage, the founder of Daily Coast, Marcos Melitzis. Hi, everybody. Hello, hello. I am Marcos Bolitsis. I'm the founder of Daily Coast, not cause, not daily knockouts. And if anybody here is Iranian, I know what coast means in Farsi. You do not need to remind me. Don't look it up. Don't Google it. Uh, we're celebrating our 20th year anniversary right now, and so glad you guys got to celebrate with us last night. Did you guys have a good time? So I'm in awe sitting here, standing before you guys, knowing how hard you're working on the front lines on our battle against a nihilistic Republican Party that is hell-bent on destroying everything that is great about our democracy. And I know we're tired. We survived four years of Trump, and he doesn't want to leave, and we got to keep fighting. I know it's hard, but once again, we're facing yet again the most important election of our lifetime. Trademark. Copyright. But I will say, of all the most important elections of our lifetime, I don't think we've ever seen such a wide disparity in potential outcomes between victory and defeat, because our democracy is on the ballot. So before we talk a little bit more about November, I really want to take a moment to, to reflect on how far we've come the last 20 years. Because it's really easy to get sort of trapped in the moment and get angry at what Joe Biden said or didn't say or Chuck Schumer or, uh, um, and, or <laughs> Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, right? We have lots of reasons to be frustrated, but we also have to understand that we've really come a long way because the Democratic Party of 20 years ago, when this movement began, Daily Coast, and by extension, Netroots Nation, which was an outgrowth of the Daily Coast community, the reason was there, was there was no real Democratic Party. There was no progressive voices in media, which was dominated at the time, of course, by television, 
uh, print and radio. The Dark Ages. And so Daily Code sort of fit, filled a, a, a market niche, a market need. And from that, we started organizing and we started talking about how we, how we become a better Democratic Party because it was awful at the time. Some of you are too young to know. It was, it was awful, right? In 2004, Howard Dean was considered radical because he argued that he represented the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party. That was considered radical because we had wings. He was drummed out of the, Repub uh, the Democratic uh, presidential primaries because he supported civil unions. Do you guys remember civil unions? This was the fake marriage, but we couldn't say marriage because it might offend some people because Democrats, Democrats would say marriage was between a man and a woman. Marriage is a man and a woman. So, Barack Obama gets elected, hope. And you think it's bad now that we have to deal with Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. There was like 12 of them in the Senate. Joe Lieberman, Max Baucus, Ben Nelson, Bill Nelson, Mary Landrieu, Mark Pryor, Claire McCaskill. I mean, it was impossible. We had 59, we had 60 at one point, and still couldn't get anything accomplished. So we've come a long way. It's a much more unified party ideologically and in purpose. And I think we need to take a moment to really appreciate that we made that happen. Even things like Act Blue, which <laughs> Democrats thought that getting dark, get that uh, Citizens United would destroy them. And it didn't because they were able to shift to being people powered, not corporate power. <laughs> so we have come a long way, but it came at a cost because all those terrible Democrats that we talk about, they all represented rural white, uh, agricultural conservative leaning states. They're gone. They represented places like Arkansas and Louisiana, Nebraska. They're gone. So now we have a 50-50 Senate, which is not a democratic institution. We all know that. 20% of the population have 50 seats. So we already have to deal with the structure of our flawed democracy. And we do so as we head into, once again, the most important election of our lifetime. And like I said, it's the difference between winning and losing is we know what happens if we lose. And I'm not talking just the Senate and the House. I'm talking Secretary of States, governorships, attorney generals. This all matters. If we win, it's much different. All we need is to get rid of the filibuster, DC statehood. But potentially Puerto Rican statehood. Expanding the Supreme Court. Real voter protections. Ban to uh, partisan gerrymandering. I mean, I'm not talking issues. I'm talking democracy. That's what's on the ballot. And in a typical midterm election, we know the conventional wisdom. The conventional wisdom is that the party in power loses seats. And history tells us that it's an average about 30 House seats. And most of the political punditry, that's, that's what they, you know, they just assume, oh, it's gonna be a red wave, red wave, red wave, red wave. And if you look at the numbers last year, they were pretty bleak. Republicans were outperforming their 2020 numbers by about nine points. That's definitely red wave territory. It was about six last year. The beginning of this year was about nine, first few months. Talking elections like Virginia, which we lost. We almost lost New Jersey. If New Jersey's on the competitive, you know we're in trouble. And then a funny thing happened. Actually, before I get to the funny thing, why, do, um, why are midterm elections so tough on the party in power? It's because it's a referendum on the president. Very simple. And no president can win that referendum because you gotta promise the world to get elected, right? A million 10 point plans. You gotta put them on the website. Nobody reads them, but you gotta have them. And 
then you get elected president and you realize that president isn't an autocrat in this country. We had to go through Congress, you got a Supreme Court. It's difficult to make anything happen. You can never make things happen. So already you're losing that way. Then you have uh, that president's supporters. Big chunk of them, they're not that engaged politically. They did their job. They voted for president. Now they can politically sleepwalk for the next four years until the next election. Then there's people like us who are paying attention and we're like, God damn it, why didn't this happen? Why did Biden say that? Or why didn't he say more about this? Or, and then we start picking everything apart. And that sort of demobilizes, demoralizes. It's not fun, right? You're like fighting the guy you want to like. And that's why Joe Biden's at like 38% approval rating. It's not, it's not conservative. They already hated him from day one. People like us being like, ugh. So that's usually, in any real election, that should have been enough. That would have been enough to say, okay, this is, this, this is gonna be a rough year, might as well call it right now. Why even bother having the election? But I was arguing a year ago that this was not gonna be a typical midterm election. And anomalies happen. It happened after 9-11 with George Bush. When things are so different or so uh, dramatically, the, the norms are changed and the environment's so different that maybe we can't look to history to determine what's gonna happen. And so, I wish I had water up here. Um, you know, funny thing happened then. It, it's Donald Trump never got off the stage. And you can't have a referendum on the president if the old president won't get the fuck out of the way. And it's even worse than that. It's not just he wants to be on stage and, uh, thanks so much. It's not so much that he won't leave the stage, it's that he's criming his way on stage. And he's forcing Republicans to stand by him on that stage. And then an even bigger thing happened. Something that I think may actually change our electoral landscape in ways that we haven't seen in decades. So by context, conservatives have the single issue voter, right? They're, they have two types. They have the evangelical abortion, uh, anti-abortion voter, and they have the second, second Amendment gun nut. They will vote for every election, no matter when it's at, up and down the ballot, and they don't care who the candidate is, and they don't care about anything else that's happening at that time. Single issue. We may look today at the evangelical support for Donald Trump, and you may think, oh yeah, they were always with him, but they weren't. They were with Ted Cruz in their primary. They did not like him for the same reason you would assume they wouldn't like him, because he's a disgusting moral creature. Yet, once he won the nomination, all that went away. The candidate didn't matter, nothing else mattered, just the fact that he would give them anti-abortion judges. And it worked. They did what they were supposed to do. We haven't had that. Our choice movement has tried for decades to have that, but people didn't believe them. You know, the boy who cried wolf keeps saying that Republicans are gonna take away our right to choose, and, but they never do. And they didn't really want to, we know that. They didn't really want to. They thought it was the greatest electoral wedge. What they wanted is for uh, Justice, um, uh, the Supreme Court just maybe hack away a little bit more at, at abortion rights. Just chip away at the edges like they kept doing year after year after year. But obviously they did not do that. And Dobbs has changed that equation. And we're seeing in the data, in the numbers, that something big is happening. There is a shift underway. And we're seeing that in the elections that happened after Dobbs was leaked. Remember, Republicans were plus nine before Dobbs. After Dobbs was leaked, we've had 11 special elections and they were Democrat plus three. That means the Democratic candidates were outperforming Joe Biden plus three. And if you look at the Senate races and the governor races and the secretary states races that matter this year, they all matter, but that are particularly important, it's a presidential battlegrounds, right? It's Florida, Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. In fact, the only Senate battleground that isn't a presidential battleground is Ohio, weirdly. So this actually 
when we're at a razor's edge, plus or minus three, you shift that plus three on our direction, everything is in play. Now, here's the thing. After Dobbs was released officially, there had been three special elections. And in those three special elections, the Democrats had moved plus six. And if you're looking at the registration numbers, here in Pennsylvania, Tom Bonier of, of Target Smart has been tweeting about this. I highly recommend you can check it out. He's been tweeting about the voter registration numbers, and it is absolutely dramatic. We're talking about uh, heavily female, and even the men who are, who are registering to vote are two to one Democratic. About half of them are under the age of 25. Something's happening here. So it is our job, my job, your job, is to take advantage of this gift. And I know it sounds crass to talk about Dobbs as a gift, but long term, we got to think long term. This is an opportunity. Because not only did they get rid of Roe v. Wade, but they also, uh, um, Clarence Thomas basically laid out the agenda. Oh, yeah, this is just abortion, but we're coming after a contraception. We're coming after same-sex marriage. We're coming after sodomy. He's basically, under, basically saying that all our privacy rights are under the gun. And so this is creating what is clearly a groundswell. We have to write it, because if we do that, we talked about what we can do. We expand the Supreme Court. We have a Congress that will pass, that will codify Roe protections in law, and a Supreme Court that will then uphold it. That is what we are fighting for. So that is your job. That is my job. I'm not only in absolute awe of all of you and the work that you do, but I'm supremely confident that we're going to win this election. Thank you so much. I got one more thing. One more thing. So who wants to know where Netroots Nation is next year? All right. It's July 13 to the 15th. And it's going to be in my hometown of Chicago. Thanks. Now give a warm welcome to the Democratic nominee for Lieutenant Governor for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Austin Davis. Hello, Netroots Nation. I'm so happy Netroots is back in Pittsburgh since its first time in 2009. In 2009, President Obama had just been elected. The, the Pittsburgh Steelers had just won the Super Bowl, and I was a freshman in college. Since then, we've made real progress. A lot has changed in the last 13 years. Sometimes it feels like we've gone backwards. But I know we've made real progress because I've seen it and I've lived it. I stand before you today as a black kid from a small steel town, often overlooked by power brokers in Harrisburg and Washington, as the proud son of a union bus driver and a hairdresser, part of the first generation in my family to go to college and earn a college degree, as the Democratic nominee for Lieutenant Governor in the great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I'm running to be Pennsylvania's first black lieutenant governor. That's real progress. My story shows the promise of progressive leadership. I got my calling to public service after somebody was shot on my block when I was 16 years old. I went to a McKeesport City Council meeting, the town that I grew up in, and there were two things that I noticed when I went to that meeting. One, there was nobody in government that looked like me, and there was nobody in the government talking about the issue of gun violence. So instead of waiting for somebody else to do it, I got involved at 16 years old and created a violence prevention organization to help combat gun violence in my community. That led me to become the first black state representative to ever represent Pennsylvania's 35th legislative district or any district in western Pennsylvania outside of the city of Pittsburgh. Over the past five years, I fought for working class people in our state capital. 
fighting for working class families and investing in our communities, fighting to reduce blight and remediation, fighting to connect communities that have been left behind from the collapse of the steel mill industry to the economies of the future, fighting to make sure health care is more affordable for those who need it, standing up to big polluters when they seek to take advantage of our communities and our people, and fighting to reform our policing system to create the first officer misconduct database in our Commonwealth's history. But my work isn't over, and neither is yours. The stakes could not be higher, and the contrast could not be clearer here in Pennsylvania. Josh Shapiro and I are running to move Pennsylvania forward, to create an economy that works for everyone, to ensure every child has access to a quality education, regardless of their zip code, to make sure our communities are safe from gun violence, and to protect our freedoms and fundamental rights. Our opponent is the most extreme and dangerous gubernatorial candidate in the country. He seeks to ban abortions with no exceptions for rape, incest, or life of the mother. He seeks supporters from a website called Gab, where it's a haven for anti-Semites and extremists. And let's talk for a minute. The Republicans, the Republicans love to cloak themselves in the banner of freedom. Well, it doesn't sound like freedom when they tell women what they can and can't do with their own bodies. It doesn't sound like freedom when they say you get to vote, but they get to pick the winners. And it doesn't sound like freedom when they tell our children what they can and can't learn. Your work, the work you all are doing in your respective communities couldn't be more important. We need you off the sidelines and in the game right now. This won't be easy, but we need you involved in our campaign here in Pennsylvania. We need to build a movement to power change in Pennsylvania and across this country. More than winning this election, we need to meet this moment, inspiring and mentoring the next generation of leaders. And I've often said that the people closest to the pain should be closest to the power. We have an opportunity to send that message loud and clear in this election. Thank you. Let's go to work and let's win all across this country. Thank you. To close us out from the great state of Minnesota, let's welcome Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. Thank you. It is so great to be back at Netroots National and to be in community with you all. Uh, I was backstage listening to some of the incredible speakers you've all had talk about how alive our movement is and all of the work that we've been able to accomplish. Our movement is at a watershed moment. Over the past several years, we've seen the biggest resurgence of progressive organizing and movement building in our lifetimes. Across the country, young people are reviving the labor movement and nudging history wins in union organizing that has not been seen since the 1930s. Whether it is Amazon workers, Starbucks workers, Google workers, or Trader Joe's, we have taken on some of the biggest, wealthiest multinational corporations in the world. And we are winning. Petition to file a union is up to 57% over a year ago. And I'm proud that workers in my office led a movement to unionize the staff of the United States Congress, and we are just getting started. But friends, it is not just unions. If someone told me when I was eight years old, huddled in a refugee camp, 
that I would one day serve the people of Minnesota as the first African born, the first hijabi, the first woman of color to be elected for Minnesota and one of the first two Muslim women in Congress, I would not have believed the words coming out of your mouth. But in spite of millions of dollars in super PAC spending against us in four consecutive elections, we have won. It is because of you, the progressive movement, that that is why I'm standing here today. It's because of you, the progressive movement, that we have the most black, the most Latinos, and the most female members of Congress in our nation's history. It is because of you, the progressive movement, that here in Pittsburgh, we are about to have a black mayor, a black lieutenant governor, and a proud, unbought, unbossed, fierce, progressive black congresswoman named Summer Lee in Congress. <laughs> Who would have thought a couple of months ago that we were on the cusp of passing the most progressive piece of climate legislation in our nation's history. That's right, this summer alone, we have passed laws to rein in gun violence, to get veterans needed health care, and a bill to cut carbon emissions by close to 40%. I was gonna end that sentence with, you did that, but it sounds like you all don't know that it is because of you that we have been made to accomplish all of these things. Because the reality is none of these things would be possible without a massive, focal, organized, progressive movement driving the narrative and pushing for change. Because I know this, when you show up, it gives us the power to organize the base and to work to push for change on the inside. Even when the challenges seem insurmountable, we have organized. Over the last two years, right after George Floyd was murdered at the hands of the police department in my district, now a lot of people say nothing has changed, that people are afraid there is no meaningful reform to public safety. But as we speak today, a department of public safety is being crafted in Minneapolis. And that would not have happened without a movement in Minnesota and around the world pushing for it. But I want to be clear about something else. We cannot take any of that for granted now. It is when you start to get comfortable that your opponents strike. And I know this very well. We have to be alert we have to protect our victories as vigorously as we fight for them. Because we cannot build on those wins if they are rolled back. Labor rights, abortion rights, criminal justice reform, even the very survival of our democracy is being threatened at this moment. We are up against forces that are willing to suppress the vote, overturn elect election results, and literally commit treason against our country to get their way. We are up against corporate donors, landlords, and war profiteers spending millions of dollars to take out progressive members of Congress. So I wonder why are they desperate? They're desperate because they know they are losing. They know people do not want more endless wars. They know people do not want to be shackled with student debt. They know people don't want to live in an uninhabitable planet. So they lie. In fact, Big Oil was literally funding ads against the Inflation Reduction Act pretending to be environmentalists. 
The only way to protect our wins is with the massive, historic voter turnout. We cannot go after the same tiny slices of swing voters. We go after election after election. Using the same poll-tested talking points, we use every election. We cannot assume that the politics of transaction will turn out the votes when Americans are longing for the politics of transformation. No, we need to turn out a record number of voters to send a clear signal to the electorate that the progressive movement is here to stay. In 2016, 6.7 million people who voted for President Barack Obama in 2012 voted for a third party candidate or simply stayed home. That is more than the total number of Obama voters who voted for Trump combined. These non-voters are more likely to be working class, they are more likely to be immigrants, and they are more likely to be people of color. In fact, more than half of them have an income of less than $30,000 a year. These are the people the Democratic Party should stand for. We cannot rely on Liz Cheney or Joe Manchin <laughs> of the world to save us. We need to elevate people who have fluency in the day-to-day -day struggles of the people they seek to represent. For every moderate suburban Republican, there are line cooks, home workers, dishwashers, cashiers, farm workers who would vote a straight Democratic ticket if they were given a reason to. Because one thing we have learned is this. Progressives win when turnout is high and when we, we lose when turnout is low. So this election, we cannot let fear defeat us. Let us focus on those who don't have a voice and who will support our boldest, most endearing ideas as a party. Let's elevate the people who are closest to the pain. Let's give working folks a reason to turn out to vote for us. That's who our party should be for. That's who our party should be talking to. And that's who we should be counting on to help us save our democracy in November. So thank you all for turning up. Thank you for organizing. Thank you for your optimism. And thank you to Netroots for getting us here together. I love you. Let's work together to save this democracy. Let's go fight, win. <laughs>